All right, we're going to get started. So thanks, everyone, for uh, stopping by for this session today. I know we are standing in between you and probably lunchtime, so we'll make sure it's as exciting and uh, as informative as possible. Um, so I'll get started by uh, introducing myself. Um, I'm Timmy Adebambo. I lead our security specialist solution architecture team for the Americas. And with me today is uh, Madeline. Hi, I'm Madeline Vanderpelt. I'm a team lead and software developer at Trend Micro, and I work on the Cloud One platform. Yep, so uh, today's uh, presentation is on a security first expansion. Uh, seven services, six weeks, and six regions. Uh, it's basically uh, a walkthrough of the experience and the really innovative expansion that happened at Trend Micro with the Cloud One product. Um, we will go through um, <clears throat> with you guys, um, all of the all of the challenges, or at least the highlights of the challenges, and how the team resolved it, as well as what um, were the pretext and uh, the objective of uh, going through this exercise. Um, as part of that, we will go through uh, what is the Cloud One platform for those of you that I may not be familiar with that. Um, we would also uh, talk a little bit about multi-region architectures, which is uh, becoming more and more important, and I'm sure that's part of what draws uh, some of you uh, here today. Uh, and then uh, Madeline will cover a lot of the challenges from the complexity to the deployment and operations and team empowerment that was part of the journey here. All right. Um, how many of you have heard of uh, Cloud One? Anyone? All right, so a few people. Um, so Cloud One is a collection of integrated security services um, that, off, that, that comes together as a single solution um, that covers everything from code pipeline all the way to operations at scale. Um, you know, one of the challenges that security um, tools had were that they were very pinpoint solutions and, you know, you'd have this for serverless and you'd have that for containers. And what Cloud One um, as a product uh, achieves is bringing all of these elements together as one single uh, solution. And it's built on AWS, obviously, and that was what's made it, what enables it to be able to uh, scale at the speed that uh, we're going to cover today. Um, it really covers, as you can see on the screen, uh, container security, application security, workload security, um, file security, and uh, uh, network security, as well as uh, uh, open source security. So that's, that's, the, that's the product. That's the Trend Micro product, um, really popular and gaining even more traction that we needed to um, uh, expand on, uh, on AWS. And how, how did that happen? Um, I'm going to quickly go through the high-level um, services that empowered this. Um, I'm, I'm going to let Madeline dive a lot deeper into what actually took place uh, to get that going. Uh, but you could imagine that if you're moving across, uh, different, uh, across different regions, you want to have the services that are enabling you to scale along with it, and you want to architect them in a way that makes that happen. Um, you will see here that we have God Duty and CloudTrail uh, pointing to the InfoSec um, box, um, largely because the, the CloudTrail for the envi entire environment um, is something that the InfoSec team uh, takes the responsibility of making sure they're monitoring and, and getting the insights to all the accounts, no matter how many alphas and, and, and devs and prods uh, there are. And you have God duty alerting across, you know, uh, de delegated admin format where uh, it's configured across the entire uh, landscape. And then moving to the right, you get some more development tools that really help scale uh, co code pipelines, event bridge, systems manager, code pipeline, obviously, for pushing code across the different regions, which uh, we'll talk about a, a little bit some more. Uh, KMS, obviously, um, keeping things uh, secure and encrypted across, across the the landscape, secrets manager, of course, S3, and very importantly, uh, cloud formation uh, to make sure all of this is done as infrastructure as code. Um, so uh, on, the, on the high level, these are some of the AWS foundational services that really uh, this product is built upon, along with some other uh, well-designed architectures that are proprietary to uh, Trend Micro. So what is the challenge here? If we return to the context of this presentation, now that you have a little bit foundation of what the product uh, that we're trying to expand is. Um, 
it's a, it's a rollout from just having the US region, as you can see, to UK, Germany, India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, because as you can imagine, um, not only do they have customers in all those regions, or are, are, are they aspiring to have customers in all those regions, but even customers in a single region could have workloads that span multiple regions that they want to protect. So it is important to have presence um, in all of these regions and to be able to do it in a quick and nimble way uh, was basically the, the number one challenge that had to be addressed. So uh, why deploy a multi-region multi, uh, architecture? Um, and anyone here uh, already runs a multi-region architecture? Yeah, one, two, huh? a, few, a few folks. Um, yeah. I, I, Multi-region architectures are becoming more and more important as the uh, landscape uh, evolves around data and regulations, for example. Um, that's one of the main reasons why Trend Micro decided to do this. Um, a lot of customers have compliance requirements uh, and regulations that states that data needs to reside uh, in a particular region or country. So whether it's Germany, we have um, China, Israel, Brazil, um, many countries are having data, regula data residency rules. And in order for you to you know, work with that customer and have that as part of your, uh, your market, you want to have uh, the ability to tell them that their data is gonna stay in that region. Um, so that is a, a very important driver for this and it's gonna become even more important for any business that tries to operate globally um, on AWS or, or in the cloud. Um, next is to improve latency. Um, this, this becomes more important depending on the application that you're on. Um, the latency between a region, uh, for example, um, you know, U New York, Sydney, London, Tokyo users would vary greatly depending on where they're trying to connect to. Um, in this example, I have users from, you know, this for, uh, these four locations, and the way it's set up now is so that the U New York users can connect to US East. Um, you could have the um, the users from Sydney connect to the southeast in APAC. You could have London connect to EU and Tokyo connect to the northeast. That may seem trivial, but what actually happens uh, is that if you don't have that kind of localization, um, I will tell you right now, a, lo a localized region probably um, gets about 20 milliseconds uh, within the region at AWS. But once you get from, let's say, US West, and you're trying to get to the London uh, region, you'll be looking at about 140 milliseconds. And if you're going from Sydney to the EU region, um, then you're looking at like 300. So you could be up to 15x slower um, in terms of latency just because of the design decisions to not go multi-region. And depending on how sensitive your applications are, um, this could be a really, a really important factor, uh, especially in some industries. Uh, so it, it's another main reason why you, know, you wanna think about um, uh, going multi-region if you haven't already uh, thought about that. Um, then I'll talk about business continuity, and this is becoming more, more important, more relevant with different attack vectors in the industry, um, and just having the ability to continue business for operational downtimes and different reasons. If you have um, you know, applications in US, US East and the service goes down um, for those in San Francisco, what you can have is the ability to you know, not connect to US East and then go to um, US Central. Um, that enables you to have, yeah, slightly degraded service. You might be experiencing uh, slightly larger latency, but the key difference is that you're, you're still able to continue that service. You're still able to continue operations. So there's still uh, continuity. So if you have you know, a ransomware incident or something really hard in one region, you could still actually operate while you figure out a way to back up, restore, or uh, make sure that the other region comes back on. And of course, that is a, a, a board level issue at this time for a lot of organizations looking at security is how do we make sure that our operations are continuing in, in the face of different incidents and attacks that are prevalent. Um, so those are three really important reasons. I, I won't go too deep into uh, multi-region architectures uh, beyond the, the core reasons why you may wanna consider it and, and, and what advantages it provides. Um, I'll spend a little bit talk, uh, talking about how uh, Trend Micro kind of looked at the, the security services as they looked to expand across all of the regions here. And uh, you know, I'll start from the top, which is the InfoSec team. The InfoSec team really 
um, did not try to take over all of the security uh, management for the entire rollout roll uh, across all the regions. Uh, it, was more, it was most important to take the, the cloud trail, which gives the visibility to all the different activities that are going on and then uh, allow account owners who are closer to the accounts to actually manage the alerts that they get from God duty, as well as the permissions as to who should have access to the various environments that they actually operate. Um, and then below that, the service teams that actually create the, the services that we have inside the uh, Cloud One product will be able to make a better decision about what permissions at the WAF level, at the infrastructure level, um, the applications need, and which uh, keys um, should be, uh, which, which KMS keys should be used for different services to ensure data protection and segregation of data uh, accordingly. So um, it, this was deliberate. Um, it is a structure that allows the scaling of the environment uh, so that InfoSec doesn't necessarily uh, control everything, but they have visibility to everything. And this is a challenge that um, if many don't solve ahead of time, you actually realize that it's very hard to scale out because um, you, you don't have the flexibility within the service teams because InfoSec is too rigid and InfoSec feels like, you know, the, the service teams are like overstepping. And this is part of the foundational things that need to be considered when trying to go multi-region is how have you decentralized uh, the security, uh, different layers of security to allow the flexibility to do it while still having the visibility uh, to monitor it. Um, one more thing is the enabling services. Uh, needless to say, all of this cannot be accomplished without having infrastructure as code and using uh, cloud formation as the foundation for that and using um, the code pipeline uh, service which enables to, uh, you to push to multiple regions and push consistently and have security checks in between uh, as we push. Well, I'm not gonna dive into, into that. I am going to let um, Madeline uh, talk a little bit more about how did uh, Cloud Micro get there with uh, Cloud One. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so how did Cloud One get there, right? It's a big product, there's lots of security services. We have seven on the board there that you saw earlier. Um, how do you even start? So that was our first challenge, right? Where do you begin with a project this size? Um, and who here uses you know, microservices? A couple people, cool, awesome. Uh, who has a monolith with a ton of spaghetti code? It's all tangled. You might not want to admit to it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we looked at what we'd been doing, and then we looked at where we wanted to be. So we started with the end in mind, and we thought about, okay, what do we want our product to look like two weeks from now, two months from now, 10 years from now? Where do we want it to be? And how do we build something that gets us there? Instead of thinking about, you know, what can we build today? We were trying to think about what we could build that would actually uh, sustain the scale that we were trying to achieve and sustain uh, over time, right, with best practices and different things. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, great book, by the way. Uh, but yeah, think about where, where does your product need to go and start there. And take, it's a really big step to take back, especially as a developer, right? I'm very much in the weeds coding every day, um, and so, to take that step back and, and think about the bigger picture, it's actually a really hard thing to do. So I challenge you all to do that. So once we took that step back, we thought about, okay, we have this monolith, we got a lot of spaghetti code, <laughs> and that wasn't working too well for us. And we had the opportunity here to like, start from scratch and build whatever we wanted. So let's think about how we could build that the best way possible. And for us, that meant learning about microservices and starting to uh, create things that had clear boundaries and services that had one purpose instead of 10 or, or, or thousands. <laughs> and slowly we integrated these services a few at a time. We built them up over time, started connecting them together, and we were actually able to continuously deliver value. So whereas before, you know, how, how many people deploy their services on every push to master? One, two, a couple. How many deploy daily? A couple people. How many are more than, more than that, like weekly? How many are even longer than that? Please, nobody. <laughs> Good, that's awesome, we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> so we started there too, right? We started with, when I joined Trend Micro four years ago, the product I was working on was deployed 
bi-weekly, every two weeks. Um, and over time, it was weekly, and then now daily. And with our microservices, what we've built now, we actually deploy every time we have a change, and it's passed all of the tests, and we know that it's good to go. We just give it right to our customers. There's no waiting. Um, so we continuously deliver value. But what does that mean? It's a little scary when you go from like these long pauses in between delivering your code and, and you have time, you know, if you notice a bug or something, you have time before it has even hit the customer. Whereas if you deliver constantly, um, you know, somebody could actually notice a bug. So iteration is key, not being afraid to fail. Um, and being able to deliver value really quickly means that if there is a problem, you can fix it really quickly as well. Um, so iteration is, is huge. Um, start small, build up, keep adding features, you know, over time. So that's where we started. And now that we have a couple of microservices, how do we deploy them? How do we, and how do we do that securely and safely and confidently? So I'm going to walk you through our deployment process a little bit here. Um, bear with me. <laughs> so once we have our code and we think it's ready to go somewhere, uh, our pipeline gets kicked off. And it creates the build environment. And then from there, our build environment, which might be a container, it gets scanned. And we're scanning it for vulnerabilities uh, in the container itself. And we use, uh, actually, Cloud One container security to do that, <laughs> because why not? And once we've scanned our container, we know there's no vulnerabilities. It's past that check. We go, OK, it's safe to use this thing as a vessel to keep deploying our, our changes, our features, our security services, whatever it might be. And then we have a whole bunch of other checks that get kicked off in parallel. So we scan for third-party dependencies, and we use tools to check for vulnerabilities in the dependencies that we're using within our code. Uh, we use other tools to scan the code itself um, and check for you know, gaps and uh, tell us if we're meeting best practices or not. Uh, we lint our CloudFormation template. And what that basically means is we're scanning it for uh, best practices to make sure that we're following uh, rules that we've put in place because somebody on some team uh, found a problem. And they said, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And so you can add a rule to the linter. And what that does is the next time somebody deploys and they've left that hole open, uh, it goes, hang on, wait. You don't want to do this. If you fix it, it'll actually be more secure. Or this is a better way of doing what you were trying to do. Um, so we use linters on our CloudFormation templates. Uh, we also scan our CloudFormation template with Cloud One Conformity, which checks it for security vulnerabilities, things like open S3 buckets or um, missing KMS keys or uh, you know, permissions that are way too wide open, things like that. And of course, we run tests, unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, all sorts of tests, as many tests as we can to make sure that our code is doing what we intend it to do. And then we, sorry? She had a question. You have a question? Yeah. Sure. So as, as it's going through um, all the different phases here, do you have an entity or some group that uh, approves it to go to the next step? Or is all this actually just happening in an automated fashion seamlessly and there's no human interaction? So the question, I'm just going to repeat it, was uh, do all these steps happen in an automated fashion or is there a human involved? And that's an awesome question. Thank you. There's no humans involved. Uh, all of these steps happen in our pipeline. And as it goes through, if it fails one of these checks, it stops the build, doesn't deploy anything, and the human is then notified. <laughs> and then we can go and remediate it. So for example, if um, you know, conformity scanned our template, found an open S3 bucket, uh, the build would fail. We'd get alerted that it had failed. We'd go and check, and it would tell us what had happened. Um, and we'd then be able to go and fix it. Um, yeah, so once we've done all of those things, we package up our code, it's ready to go. So then we start actually deploying it. And for this, we use AWS Code Pipeline. And what happens is it's passed all of these checks. We know that it's good to go. We're confident. Well, we still roll it out over stages. So we don't just push it right to production. That would be a little too scary for us. So we have pre-production environments uh, called alpha, for example, and any number of pre-production environments in between alpha and staging. And so first we'd go to alpha. 
And once we know it's working there, we'll go to whichever environments, we'll eventually get to staging, we'll make sure it's all working there, we'll eventually get to production. And even within our deployments, to go to alpha, to go to staging, we have rings. And what this means is we don't just roll out to every single region that we want to deploy to all at once. We roll out to one region, and then in ring two, we might roll out to another one region, and then in ring three, we might roll out to five regions and keep building up. And the same as how we started with those small services integrating slowly and building up, we do the same thing when we roll it out. Question over there. Uh, good question. The, so the question was, do we have a quality insurance environment? Our alpha and pre-production environments are sort of like that. Um, as we roll out, so each ring, we go to one region, and uh, we don't just deploy it and then move on. We deploy it, we run tests, we make sure it's operating as we expect it to. Um, and if those tests fail, it stops right there, and we don't go to any further regions. Um, so it's fully automated in that sense. Um, and we have these pre-production environments where you know, I and anybody else can go and play, and it's sort of like a playground for our developers uh, and for our QA people and for anybody else who wants to um, see how their changes are operating. And we can also, using code pipeline, um, pause between alpha and staging and break the connection temporarily uh, because let's say we do want to run a larger QA test, a manual test, we want to make sure that this big thing that we just deployed is doing what we expect it to do, and we want that extra assurance. We can basically pause the execution of the code pipeline and go run those tests, take as long as we need to, and then re-enable that connection and allow the pipeline to keep going. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and yeah, so we have mul multiple stages, many stages, and within that we have many rings. Uh, that we deploy to little by little, building it up until we have confidence that we're ready to go to the next stage and the next until we hit production. So then what about after you've deployed? Do you just stop there? No, we don't just stop there. We have lots of tests and they run continuously. We call them canaries. You might call them post-deployment tests. Uh, lots of different names for them, but basically we have Lambda functions, different things that run in our environment that continuously invoke our services to make sure that they're running exactly how we expect them to, to make sure that they're still passing all of the quality bars and all of the um, functional tests that we expect them to. So we use these canaries. We run them yeah, mostly with lambdas. Uh, we integrate them with Amazon CloudWatch. Um, and we actually create alarms based on our canaries. So if they start failing, and they failed for five minutes in a row, something might be wrong. And the canaries are a very quick indicator after you've deployed if it'll tell you if something's gone wrong way faster than your customers will. So instead of waiting for you know, a case to come in from a support engineer saying, hey, we noticed this page isn't loading properly, or I clicked this button and it's not doing anything anymore, um, our canaries can tell us that. And when our alarms go off, so we have alarms on lots of different things, um, not just on our canaries, but also on how our code's operating, how our, the AWS services that we're using are operating, um, if we're hitting concurrency issues or you know, we're seeing too many 500 errors coming in from our APIs, um, we have alarms for those too. And all of our alarms, all of our metrics, our dashboards and CloudWatch, they're also done as infrastructure as code. So we don't just you know, go in manually and decide one day, like, oh, maybe we should monitor this thing. We think about it as we're creating our features and as we're developing, what do we need to know? What might we need to know to monitor and to give us observability, which is actually slightly different. So when we're monitoring, those are things, we have alarms in place. They're things that we know might happen, so we have alarms. Observability and those extra metrics that we have on our dashboard are there for the times when something goes wrong and we didn't know that it was even possible that that thing could happen. <laughs> and you know, uh, we use all those things for incident response. We have playbooks 
and run books in place, uh, which tell us exactly what to do. So that, you know, if I'm not the person on call and I don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night, like I'm sure many of you don't, um, <laughs> then whoever is on call can use the playbooks um, to know exactly what to do and how to handle the situation. Uh, as I mentioned, we have all these pre-production environments. Uh, we treat them just the same. So we have alarms in our alpha environment and we monitor them. The development teams actually monitor them and make sure that things are operating as we expect. Because these pre-production environments get rolled out to first, we can actually notice changes and issues that might affect prod before the rollout has even finished going to production. So sometimes we can even stop it before it's deployed to production and after it's deployed to alpha because our alarms and our canaries and everything that's running can tell us that there's something wrong. So I got a little ahead of myself with that, but <laughs> that's also part of how we operate our microservices. So yeah, we have all these new microservices. They all are fairly small, independent things. They're working together. There's a lot going on now, right? Instead of just having one monolith with a ton of code that everybody can contribute to. So how do you operate all of that? Who here has an operations team, dedicated operations teams? A couple of people, cool. Uh, does anybody do ops themselves? Awesome, a couple people. <laughs> so on my team, we do everything from developing the service, deploying the service, operating the service, maintaining it, making sure it's running as we expect it to. Um, and that's because when we went from the monolith to this distributed system of microservices, we didn't have, you know, as many operations specialists as we did developers, right? So somebody had to step in. So when your development teams start doing operations as well, that's another complexity to give them. You're giving them deployment, you're giving them feature, like writing the features, you're now giving them operations. So the biggest thing is investing in infrastructure as code. It removes all of the manual toil, a lot of the issues that you may have seen in the past with operations, having to have the right permissions to do something, having to call somebody uh, in a different time zone or late at night to come in just to click a button uh, to deploy something or to um, go and make a little change. Well, if you invest in the infrastructure as code, you can actually make those changes yourself. You can make them through code. They're reviewed because you I, at least I hope you all have code reviews. <laughs> um, so, you know, you review the changes, we work together, it's very collaborative. Um, and occasionally we still have to pull in operations people who have higher privileges, but it's really minimized that. Um, and with this, we've also locked down our staging and production accounts. So our AWS accounts, I can go in, but I can't even read some of the data. So we, we stay as far away from customer data as we can. Um, I have no permissions to go in and change anything, no write permissions. And even our read permissions are restricted. So it removes this temptation to make manual changes. And in fact, even if I was tempted to, I couldn't. <laughs> so it really simplifies the deployment. It takes that burden away from your operations team, your developers, and it removes that toil. But it also improves disaster recovery because now what you're deploying is repeatable because it's the same everywhere. You don't have to worry about, oh, did you know, Temi go and make a change in our production account and it's not you know, written down somewhere, it's in his head, right? There's a lot of that that goes on. So when you turn to infrastructure as code, it removes all of that possibility of forgetting something or not knowing that a change had happened. And it also gives you auditability. So you know, if you're trying to figure out when did something change or why was it changed, you can go back and you can look at the commit history, and you can see in the you know, commit message why something had changed. And then you can address it. Um, the one thing to be careful of here is one-way doors, so making sure you're not making changes that can't be reversed. Um, and in general, with Amazon Web Services, it's really easy to stay away from one-way doors. They give you uh, as much flexibility as I've ever seen. So, but yeah, definitely be aware of that. So then, now that we have combined our development and operations, we've broken down these silos. Uh, our development teams really live by 
You build it, you own it, you operate it. So what that means is we've broken down this barrier that used to be between operations and development. And even within other teams, like QA, right? We've broken down all of these sort of silos, and we've got all these people talking and collaborating and working together to create the best solutions that we can create. So it really builds empathy between all of these, what used to be siloed teams. And it helps us to connect with each other and learn from each other and take all of the best practices that we've all gained over time and use them together. Um, you got a question? Yep. So the question was, do we have a separate security team still who takes actions and receives alerts based on what the developers are deploying? That's a great question. Um, we still have a security team. We have security experts um, that you know, we rely on. Um, and they help us do things like threat modeling and yeah, helping when we, when we have security issues, for sure. Um, if you think back to that deployment architecture where we have these scanners in place and all of these things that are alerting us. Our security teams are involved in configuring those and they're involved in setting up the rules and adding best practices into those uh, tools so that we can enable our developers to address security concerns uh, th themselves and not have to have security experts always involved. Because just like we didn't have a lot of operations people, <laughs> we had even fewer security experts, right? And I'm sure Many of you in this room have a similar situation where you have you know, one security expert to 100 developers. So they can't be involved in every single uh, issue that comes up. But of course, they're there as a resource. And we do uh, connect with them just like we do the operations and the QA teams and everybody else who's our architects, everybody who, who has those best practices and that knowledge. Um, yeah, so our development teams manage operations of our services until they meet criteria to go to the site reliability engineering team. And what that means is, you know, we've had, let's say, 60 days with no incidents. We have playbooks and incident response plans for every alarm that we have on the service. We've proven that our service is operationally ready. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things and checklists that we go through. And once we've met that criteria, and we, we can do a handover and knowledge transfer, and um, the site reliability engineers, or SRE, they will begin monitoring and operating our services. Um, and there's agreements that we make with them about the, the line there. So does it mean that they're going to you know, take over managing updates to our third party Libraries, does it mean that they're only operating our service? We have those discussions. We come up with a plan together so that you know, everybody's on the same page about what the expectations are. And we've been iterating on that. We're trying to find the right balance. And every team is slightly different. The services that we are creating are slightly different. And they have different needs for availability or for um, reliability. So we iterate and we're constantly uh, checking in with each other to figure out what is the right approach? And what is the right balance? And as I mentioned earlier, we have these pre-production environments. Um, we integrate our services there internally from day one. As soon as we have a service, we deploy it there. Whether it's ready for production or not, we deploy it to alpha or any of our pre-production environments. And this allows us to, uh, as somebody asked earlier about QA, it allows us to really dive in and you know, try to break each other's code and um, really work out all of the little bugs and issues uh, way before we give them to production, to our customers, to the people who are actually using our services. And we monitor them as if they're production. We can prevent rollout to production. I've mentioned this a little earlier, but it's, it's, really, it's really powerful because you get your developers learning about incident response. And a year ago, I probably wouldn't have been very helpful if you put me in the middle of an incident where customers were impacted. But when you give people the opportunity 
to learn how to manage incidents and how to stay calm under pressure, how to write good playbooks so that they can have that plan and can stay calm. It really enables people to learn in an environment that, you know, it's not mission critical if it takes a little longer to respond to the incident because it's alpha and we have no customers impacted. So it's been really good for us. We've got a lot of uh, people learning and sharing and even for incidents on alpha, we do post-incident reviews. Uh, you might hear, hear of them called post-mortems, but I like to call them post-incident reviews. And we talk about what we could do better next time and what went wrong and how, how can we prevent this from happening again? Um, what would have happened if it was customer impacting? All of these things, and it's really important to reflect on and to figure out what you can do better next time and to keep learning and keep iterating and keep striving to do better. Uh, lastly, with this, we encourage everyone, regardless of their position or how long they've been at the company or anything else, to pull the and on cord. And you may have heard of the concept of an and on cord before. Um, it's basically like hitting the emergency stop button in a factory. Um, I've actually done this before. Once upon a time, <laughs> I worked in a pickle factory. And sometimes, I'm not, not kidding, <laughs> um, sometimes what would happen is the pickles would get dumped in the cucumbers and they'd get washed and a frog would literally be jumping down the line of pickles. And <laughs> actually this happens. And you would have to scoop them out and people would freak out. They, they'd be like, oh my gosh, there's a frog. And by the time they reacted, it was already down the line and, and it was too late for them. Um, and sometimes that meant you had to hit the emergency stop button, stop the line so the frog couldn't go anywhere else, <laughs> scoop him up and bring him back to the field and let him, let him go again. <laughs> so it's the same concept, right? And even when I was you know, 15 working at the pickle factory, uh, I was allowed to hit the emergency stop button. It didn't have to be a supervisor, it didn't have to be a manager, right? We have the same concept with our code. We have a virtual emergency stop button, we call it the end on cord. And we can halt new deployments to one service, to a set of services, to everything, depending on what the problem is. So we can stop it for one code repository, we can stop it for a whole set of, of, of things, it depends what the situation is. But Everyone is encouraged to pull it. Doesn't matter if you've been at Trend Micro for a day or a decade. Um, yeah. And with that comes empowering our team. So how do you actually, you know, if, you, if it's your first day and you do notice something going wrong, how do you feel empowered to actually hit that and on cord? How do you feel empowered to say, hey, I don't think we should deploy this thing. I think we should stop rollout. And how do you empower your developers to learn to do operations, to want to do operations, to want to try infrastructure as code? Well, I'm gonna say the biggest thing is celebrating your mistakes. And when I say celebrating, I literally mean celebrating. My team on Fridays, we get together, we talk about what we learned that week, what went well, what caused us pain, and we talk about our oops moments. So what happened this week where you went, oops, shouldn't have done that, um, and, and what did you learn from it? How did you fix it? And we can learn from each other and, and we can celebrate those mistakes and we can figure out how to prevent them from happening again. And as I mentioned earlier, we're breaking down these silos. So we're bringing everybody together who has all of this experience and all of this knowledge across all of these different domains, operations, development, security, QA. We're bringing them all together so that we can learn from each other, so that we can create the best practices, so that we can help each other grow and learn. And we're pushing decision-making authority to where the information is. This is something I learned from a book called Turn the Ship Around. Again, a very good book. It's one of my favorites. Um, and in the book, the author, uh, he proposes this notion of using I intend to. So I intend to make this change and I know it will work because I have done X, Y, and Z. And we've started using this on my team and it's, it's growing, it's catching on with other teams too, which is really cool. And it really gives the developer 
the opportunity to, to control that decision, to be empowered to make that decision. And it gives other people the opportunity to step in if they need to, to say, hey, have you thought about this? Or did you check you know, that this thing is already set? Or do you need help to roll this out? Right? It gives other people the opportunity to step in to support that person and help them make better decisions without having to say, hey, can I go do this thing? Well, instead, it's I would like to do this thing because I have checked these other things. And through all of this, the biggest thing is collaboration, right? So we're getting all these people talking. We're getting them all together. We're getting them collaborating and contributing across all these areas that used to be siloed. And pair programming comes really well with that. Um, so sometimes we have our security experts pairing with our development teams or our operations teams or anybody who's traditionally in one of these buckets or silos. And we get them talking and we get them pairing together so that they can learn from each other. So I'd like to leave you with this. Learning is not compulsory and neither is survival. Kind of harsh when you think about it. But a year ago, two years ago, we created our first microservice. We had no idea what we were doing. We were like, you know, this monolith thing, it's not working out for us. Let's try something new. Right? We created our first microservice, and that service looks like a lot different from the services that I created two weeks ago that my team's working on now. Right? They, we've grown, we've changed, we've learned. And you can't be afraid to do that. You can't be afraid to make mistakes and to learn and, and try something new. You know, we, we deployed our first ever cloud native service a couple years ago. And that was kind of scary and really, really cool, mostly. <laughs> but we've learned from that too. And again, on the stuff that we're deploying today, the stuff that we deployed a year ago, it, it all looks very different. And we keep iterating and we keep collaborating and we keep growing together. And I'd like to challenge you all to do the same thing, to go back to your teams and think about what silos you might have and what barriers you could break down and how you can get people collaborating and talking to each other and learning from each other. So thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions if there's other questions. Yes. So are you uh, multi-region Yes. Okay. So the question was, are our pre-production environments multi-region as well? They are. We mirror exactly what we're doing in production, in our pre-production environments. Um, and this gives us confidence in those rollouts, in the tests, um, in the region themselves. Sometimes we've actually you know, tried to roll out to a new region and discovered that um, something needs to be configured just slightly differently. Um, and so, or there's something that was deployed there previously, but only to that one region and we forgot it was there and need to go clean it up or different things like that. So yes, we do mirror exactly what's going on in production in our pre-production environments. I think the, the rings were, you know, were, were part of, for, of that, you know, deploying to one ring and then the next ring. And then, so you, you were in the rings, you're deploying to more regions as you go down that, that rings list before you move to the next stage. Yeah. Any other questions? Question. Right here. What's your mean time to deploy in case something bad does make it out to production and it's a quick fix? If you're doing completely immutable, do you wait five hours to go through the deployments? Or? That's a good question as well. Uh, the question was, what is our mean time to deploy, uh, given that we have rings and stages and everything else? So generally, uh, it depends on the service, so I can't give you an exact number. <laughs> but um, think of if you've used CloudFormation before, the time it takes CloudFormation to deploy, um, we've parallelized a lot of the regional deployments. So in those rings, we deploy to one region, we deploy to one region, we deploy to five regions. Um, once we have the confidence to go to larger and larger groups. It does slow down your deployment, that's true. Um, but it gives you that confidence that I've actually found really helpful during incident response as well because, um, you know, I've you might have experienced this in the past as well, but there have been times where you know, something goes wrong and people panic and they're like, oh, I have a really quick fix. It's fine, I know exactly how to fix it. And you put the fix through and you've actually created another problem. Or 
it didn't actually fix the issue. And that's because you put in a hot patch really quickly. Um, so while it does slow it down a little bit, um, we try to optimize our pipelines and parallelize as much of that scanning and different things as we can um, to speed up our deployments. Um, some of our services, it's half an hour. Some of them are two hours. It really depends on the service itself. And if we can mitigate the issue other ways, we'll try to do that as well while we roll out the full change to, to resolve the issue. So a bit of both. And as a follow-up, do you have to deploy a state completely before you move on? Or do you do like ring one, ring one, ring one, then ring two, ring two, ring two? So the question was, do we deploy a stage entirely before moving on to the next stage, or do we do ring one in alpha, ring one in staging, ring one in prod, and, and go down that way? We deploy completely to alpha first, to all stages, and all, or sorry, all regions, all rings. Then we go to staging, then we go to prod. Um, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned, sometimes things happen in one region that might not happen in another region. Um, and so we want to be confident that what we're deploying is going to work across the board. I hope that helps. <laughs> Question over there. How does the level of access your development teams have changed as you move from your development accounts towards production? And does that impact their ability to provide support and triage between development and production? Great question. Uh, so the question was, uh, how does the level of the permissions that we have from our development AWS accounts to our production ones impact uh, our ability as developers to triage and mitigate issues. And so our, I'm going to start just by explaining our permissions first. So in our alpha environments, in our development uh, AWS accounts, we have, it's much more of a playground. We have a lot more permissions there to do uh, things that we need to do to go in and manually change things, to try things. It's, it's a playground where we can experiment and explore. Our staging and production environments are locked down. Um, I have no write permissions whatsoever. Developers have no write permissions. Uh, we do have read permissions to logs and to uh, dashboards and metrics and things like that that can give us um, the information we need during an incident. Uh, but we don't have read permissions for uh, let's say user data stored in a database. Um, so it, it really, overall, we generally have the permissions that we need to see what we need to see during an incident. Um, occasionally, we have come across this as we've been iterating and figuring out what the right balance of permissions is. Uh, and in those cases, we would um, page one of, the person, one of the people on our operations team to come in and help us. Um, and they would log in with their elevated permissions and help us find the information we need. And then during the post-incident review, we would talk about that and discuss whether or not we needed to change the model of our permissions, and if there were things that we should have had access to that we didn't. I hope that helps. Cool. Anybody else? Your question. Okay, so the question was, um, how integrated are our services with other internal services or third-party vendor services, um, and how does that impact, sorry, what's the end? Uh, your ability to deliver for the business. Right, and how does that impact our ability to deliver? Um, that's really interesting. So I would say we have both. Um, our teams, they often are integrating with other services that we've created internally. Uh, lots of microservices, they all have to talk to each other, um, which does create dependency issues. And sometimes we do integrate with uh, third-party services, like, for example, our support service might have to reach out to um, a service that had customer data so we could link the support case to the right customer. And it does add complexity when you're trying to test um, because you have to Think about whether it's the right approach to mock out those dependencies and, and um, be able to trust that they're operat operating as that you expect them to. Um, there's other tools. Uh, I can't think of what it's called right now. But you can create um, basically contract, contract testing. 
So you can create a contract between different services that say, I expect you to behave this way, and if you're going to break that contract, you have to let us know. And you can create contract tests um, that will break if you break, make a breaking change such as that. Um, so there's, there's a few different approaches that you can take to it. Uh, overall, we, that's what our alpha environment really helps with, is being able to see them all playing together and interacting and um, managing how they, how they behave together. So it's a, it's a lot of different, a lot of different things that sort of come together to enable that. Great. Well, I want to thank Temi for uh, getting up here with me today, and um, I want to thank you all for coming. If you have any other questions, uh, we'll be hanging around for a little bit here. You feel free to come up and chat with us. Um, I'd also just ask that you please fill out the session survey and uh, give us feedback and let us know what you thought. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>